Welcome to the 80s with your host, Jamie Fenderson. That's me. So what are we doing here? So this is kind of a mini series. So my pal Milo and I, we host a podcast called the 80s and 90s Uncensored. And it's been a while since we've done a mini series like, um, you know, like they used to have like V or Shogun back in the day where it was kind of like a short limited series. Uh, we did that with the 80s and 90s, 99. And it was kind of fun. We did nine weeks of 99, nine episodes just exploring 99. So uh, this time we're going to do something a little different. We're going to explore um, each year from 1980 to 1999. And uh, since I like the 80s so much and he likes the 90s so much, I'm going to do the 80s and he's going to do the 90s. So it's going to be kind of cool, right? 1980 started the 80s with a bang, literally. So on May 18th, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., Mount St. Helens blew up. Kaboom! For real. It was like uh, the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history. It exploded with the force of 26 megatons of TNT. That's like a... 1,600 times more force than than Hiroshima. So it blew up. It caused a billion dollars in damage, which is like over $3 billion in today's money. So I don't, I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't remember 1980. I was around, but my brain hadn't formed yet. But uh, my mom told me stories of about it i was around and we were in the portland oregon area which is like the epicenter it's like right there so it's it's interesting because like the pacific northwest we don't have a lot of natural disasters it's pretty mild and chill here like we don't have hurricanes or tornadoes but when we do have natural disasters they're usually pretty biblical like <laughs> giant like earthquakes or the biggest volcanic you know event in u.s history that's that's how we roll we chill out until we blow up <laughs> that's kind of like me that's how i roll so yeah it, it exploded and, and it left a big crater on the north side in fact if you look at mount st helens today and before it blew up it looks completely different like it blew up after it blew up, it created a 15-mile-high ash column. It was about, like, 40 miles wide. It looked like a nuclear cloud, mushroom cloud. Like, it looked just like one. And it even generated lightning. So you had this big volcanic mushroom cloud with lightning coming out of it. Can you imagine that? That's crazy. I wish I, I could have remembered it. But my mom told me stories about it. When I was just a kid, little kid, too young to remember things, she told me about like, hey, there's a mushroom cloud and like lightning is coming out of it. It was Armageddon. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So then ash just pretty much went all over the place. Even, even the first day it went as far like across the state into Yakima and Spokane. And it went all the way from like the Pacific Northwest down to Denver, uh, Minnesota and Oklahoma started seeing it the next day and some even reported across the globe within two weeks they got some of that ash so spewing ash all over the place so when i say 1980 rang in the 80s with a bang i mean it another interesting thing so we all think about the 80s and we think ronald reagan he was like the 80s president right but jimmy carter was president for most of 1980 until he was defeated in the November election. So it's interesting, like, he was, Jimmy Carter was president in 1980 for almost all of it. And this kind of demonstrates that 1980 was still kind of 70s, still kind of the 70s, right? And you, you can even see that in kind of the disco-y music. Like, New Wave was around and it was growing, but you still had kind of disco-y kind of stuff with the with the disco balls and all that. The early 80s was still kind of disco-y in 70s. The rock was still kind of 70s. So I don't know, some disco-y kind of examples is the village people were still doing their thing. 
They they came out with a song "Can't Stop the Music," uh, "Celebration," which I love by Cool and the Gang. That was still disco-y, but I think that's the bomb song. Uh, "Upside Down" by Diana Ross, and then <laughs> "SOS" parenthesis dit 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 dash 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 dit 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 <laughs> by the SOS band. That's super disco-y. And and that was a big song, you know, kind of big in the 80, 1980. So, yeah, it was still kind of the 70s. It was still pretty disco-y. Speaking of music, um, some of my favorites in the Billboard year-end hot top 100, uh, some of the top 20 songs, which is what I drew this upon. So number one for all of 1980 was Call Me by Blondie. Call me. Come in, come in, come in, come in anytime. A lot of people think this is about a gigolo. So, you know, when I get my uh, when I get my career going as kind of a dad bod gigolo, I think this is going to be my uh, it's going to be my theme song. But that was the number one song in 1980 for reals. Um, the number two one, I have to say, I have to be honest with you guys. I know everybody loves this song and I know everybody loves this band, but I kind of don't really like this song. It's another brick in the wall part two by Pink Floyd. I know I'm supposed to like this song. I get it. But listen, it's kind of a dull, like I just smoked weed and chill song. I get it. But then they're talking about, we don't need no education, but I don't know. A lot of people need education. <laughs> you need more education. I'm sorry, Pink Floyd. <laughs> they need education, and they should get it. <laughs> uh, the number four song was Rock With You by Michael Jackson. Again, kind of disco-y, but lots of fun. I play this one sometimes, like, out and about. And I think this is one of J Michael Jackson's best songs. And that's 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 a big thing to say considering he has so many things, so many songs, you know. Another kind of disco-y song that I love, number eight, was Funky Town by Lips Inc. <laughs> it's so good. Do, 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 won't you take me to uh, da, Funky Town? Do, 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 won't you take me to Funky Town? That's a fun one. You can play that anywhere and it would be fun. Totally fun. Another one that I love, number 11, it's called Escape, otherwise known as the Pina Colada song by Rupert Holmes, which it's the only thing he ever did as far as I know. But I like the story. It's like one that used to be ads back then, like you have to do ads in the paper <laughs> for for like personal ads. And he's like, hey, do you like Pina Coladas? And do you like Pina Coladas? And doing something in the rain and and he gets like he starts corresponding with this other with this woman who ends up <laughs> ends up they meeting is his wife right <laughs> and you're like what you like all that stuff too so luckily it, it sounds like they just rekindled their romance um but i don't i don't think that happened in real life number 13 was cruising by Smokey robinson which i dig such a cool like song to drive to and then one other thing I want to mention about music, um, also on the, the top 20, I think it was num like number 19, please don't go, don't go, don't go away. But right now in your head, you're thinking about KWS in 1992, but this song came out in 1980. I don't know if it was a remake too, but it was, it was still on the top 20 and it was by Casey and the Sunshine Band. Remember, the KWS kind of 90s disco version was a remake of this, which might have been a remake of another song, as far as I know. I don't know, but I thought that was interesting because sometimes remakes are even more popular or known than the originals. That's crazy. Since we're on the subject of music, there's something that happened on uh, December 8th. So at the 1980, at the age of 40, John Lennon was gunned down by a deranged fan in New York. That was that was a trip because, I don't know, yeah, to me that seems like an end of an era, right? Like the Beatles and the whole kind of, it, it, to me that, it's a sad way to ring in the 80s, just like mountains blowing up is a sad way to ring in the 80s, but I think it really kind of did it 
like the Beatles ended, I guess, literally. Uh, but John Lennon was great. Um, it's sad because I, I would have loved to see kind of like all the other things he might have done. And because he was only 40 and he had a lot more to give. So that's that's kind of not cool. That's not cool at all. Why don't we talk about television a bit and maybe sprinkle in some of the sports. So on February 22nd, ABC sports announcer Al Michaels delivered the lines. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! <laughs> so why do you say that? Well, in 1980, um, the U.S hockey team which is basically a bunch of college kids uh they beat out the soviet quote-unquote amateurs in the medal round uh, in the men's ice hockey in lake placid new york um it was a huge deal because these kids were underdogs like huge underdogs the soviets who were quote-unquote amateur and they were like you know, classified as soldiers or whatever. They were professionals. In fact, before they had beat out like NHL pro teams in exhibition match matches, it's like straight up Rocky Four style, right? Rocky Four shiznit. And, and they they were probably like juicing up, whatever. <laughs> it was the Soviets, right? So these were not amateurs. But the, the U.S. team was. They were literally a bunch of college kids um if you ever get a chance to see that kurt russell movie that kind of like goes over it it's really good but yeah that was that was a big deal in 1980 um also in tv may 6th ron howard who played richie and donnie uh, most who played ralph they left happy days and so henry winkler got top billing on the show he was the Foz, right it's kind of interesting because everybody knows that led to jumping the shark, the term jumping the shark, where they didn't really know what to do with the show. So eventually they had <laughs> Foz like ski jumping over sharks and stuff. <laughs> it's so dumb. But that, that that's kind of a significant event is when you lose kind of two of your main characters, then you start doing stupid things. June 20th, Vanna White was a contestant on The Price is Right. You know how they say, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And she came and she was gorgeous. Um, I think that's why like they, they gave her a job because it's like, wow, check out that contestant on The Price is Right. So then she ended up getting a job turning, you know, turning letters on, on the Wheel of Fortune. And she's been doing that ever since. That's nice. June 23rd, David Letterman. I didn't know this. David Letterman debuts on NBC, but he, he had a morning show. It was a morning show. And I don't know, like the morning audience didn't really get his stuff. So eventually like they canceled it like in October, but then he like moved to the night shift and, and then he had a night show, which like lasted for many, many years. So I think the night thing is more his thing. <laughs> and then if September, late September, Cosmos um, came on, it's the science show with Carl Sagan. I know about this because I, I love this show and I loved it even in the 80s. It's, it's a great show. It really, Carl Sagan was kind of the pioneer in science education where he's like, look, hey, I'm going to bring it to the people, you know? Uh, I thought that was cool. Uh, I, I love that show. You should watch the original Cosmos. It's still relevant today, even though he's all like eight, like 1980 looking with his, <laughs> with his outfit and stuff. It's a great show. You should watch it. Some uh, shows that debuted in 1980, three, two, one, Contact. I had forgotten all about this show. I forgot all about this show. It was on PBS and it was like this science show and it, they talked about experiments and science. It was kind of a kid show. It was all about science. Three, two, one, contact. Um, the, the, you, you, if, if you're, if you, if you remember this, you're, you're thinking about the theme song right now because this thing went throughout the eighties and I had forgotten all about it, but now I remember it and it's awesome. And then another 
TV debut. Um, Milo and I talked about this on the 80s, 90s, Uncensored a lot. Magnum P.I. Um, I love this show. Magnum P.I. is awesome. He's like this guy who... He, he was a former like Navy veteran in Vietnam, and then he turns into this private investigator. And, you know, he works for this rich guy in Hawaii and gets to, like, hang out at his house and, like, drink his wine collection and go on adventures in Hawaii with, like, beautiful women. And he's got a buddy with a helicopter, and it's a lot of fun. CBS, I I, I always wanted, he, he like, my career aspiration. <laughs> <laughs> my career aspirations were to be like a private investigator back in the 80s because I wanted to be like Magnum P.I. Uh, but, you know, now that I'm an adult, I'm like, well, private investigators, actually, it's probably a pretty mundane job. Like, they just got to go gather information about people and they probably don't go on adventures with beautiful women. They probably don't get to drive some guy's rich Ferrari and riding a helicopter with their buddy. They probably don't get to do any of that. It's probably pretty mundane. But hey, it's all about the dream. You know what I'm saying? So another show that came out. And this is still TV. Although it's not a show. It, I would call it a mini series. And I mentioned this before. Because this, what we're doing now is kind of a mini series. Shogun came out in September 15th. For five episodes. Shogun with... Uh, Richard Chamberlain about like like old Japan and and it was so popular and it was one of the things that boosted kind of the Japanese cultural phenomenon in the 80s so in the 80s you saw a lot of like Japanese things like sushi they were making all of our video games and Walkmans and then this this started out with their kind of ancient culture and and everybody was all in Japan. This helped proliferate that kind of Japanese cultural phenomenon in the U.S. And that was five episodes from September 15th to the 19th. Um, another Again, they used to do miniseries back then. Do you guys remember miniseries? I, I, I miss those. I don't know if they do those anymore. But they are coming out with a Shogun remake. I don't like remakes. You guys know that. But maybe this is something that might be okay for a remake. Um, I might check it out. I might check out this new remake of Shogun that's coming out. It sounds pretty good. We'll see. Some shows that ended in 1980. The Rockford Files. Do you guys remember The Rockford Files? I actually didn't. I watched it in syndication. But it started in 1974, I think. And then it... When it hit 1980, it was like na 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 The theme song wa 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 So the theme song I remember. It's one of my favorite theme songs. It's awesome. It's probably why I remember. It's probably one of my favorite theme songs of all time. And then Hawaii Five O ended. In 1980 and that had gone on since 1968 and one of the reasons they say maybe they created a Magnum PI was to use all of the sets in Hawaii um, which Magnum PI did they used a lot of the Hawaii 50 sets interesting let's move on to movies so the number one movie probably everyone knows this the Empire Strikes Back I mean, I, even though I can't remember 1980 per se, Star Wars proliferated through the 1980s. And The Empire Strikes Back was the best among the trilogy. Like a lot of people say that, I agree with that. It's awesome. It, it ends with a cliffhanger. You know, it's got a duel. It's got a big reveal. So 1977 Star Wars was game-changing, revolutionary. I get that. But The Empire Strikes Back was even better. It made... Uh, Almost $240 million gross, which would be kind of like almost $900 million today. So yeah, you had the big Luke versus Vader duel. That was probably the biggest reveal in movies was the fact that oh, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm about to like spoil this for you. Sorry. Uh, Vader was Luke's father 
and he revealed that after he <laughs> cut his hand off after a duel. That that sucks. That's a pretty man. That sucks to know your father just kind of like cut your hand off, and then he reveals that he's your father to you. That sucks. But uh, you know, this further s cemented Star Wars in modern mythology. It really did. Another movie I want to talk about, though, that I loved almost just as much was uh, Flesh. Ah, yeah, Flesh Gordon came out in 1980. It's this space opera. Um, it's kind of campy and it's campy adventure movie. But Queen did the soundtrack. Um, it's this fun, campy sci-fi adventure. I mean, you got Flash Gordon riding a sky scooter with Birdman attacking the forces of ming it's it's sweet it's got a cult following today and i'm a member <laughs> i'm a member of that cult <laughs> yeah i love it i i dare i say i even love that as much as the empire strikes back the number two film that year was airplane <laughs> it was a comedy <laughs> I don't I miss comedies. I don't think they're around as much anymore. And they're definitely not the big block like, they're not like number two for a whole year anymore. Um maybe they're slowly dwindling away, but in nineteen eighty a comedy was number two and it was airplane. I really miss that. The OG Friday the thirteenth came out in nineteen eighty. Yeah, that spawned eleven sequels, another cultural phenomenon. Mad Max came to America in nineteen eighty. So this was made in 1979 for Australian dollars, 400,000 bucks. And it came to America made US $100 million, if not more. It had had the record for the most profitable movie ever made until 1999 when it was overtaken by the Blair Witch Project. So that's kind of cool. And it also introduced us to uh, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Friday 13th came out, but if you want real horror, The Shining, that's what came out in 1980, by uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick, starring Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall. And speaking of Shelley Duvall, uh, Popeye came out in 1980 to poor reviews, and it wasn't a box office hit, but I say that it was underrated. It stars Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall. Um, and it was, I think the set is cool. The costumes are great. The music is good. And you can actually go visit Sweet Haven, the town that he, uh, is inhabiting during that film in Malta. A lot of cruise ships do that. It was Robin Williams first role in a movie. Uh, it was panned and I think unjustifiably so because I think Popeye is pretty good. I think Popeye is actually good. I will say that I think it's good, and I think the actors are good, I think the set is good, I think the costume and the music, the costumes, mu everything's good about it. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Let me know what you think. Interestingly, Shelley Duvall, who played Olive Oil, <laughs> uh, admitted that a lot of her elementary school, when, when she was in elementary school, uh, other students called her Olive Oil. <laughs> She's the person. She looks just like olive oil, for real. So yeah, that was uh, that was a good start to 1980s movies. So that's awesome. And some of the most popular books in 1980. So The Born Identity, the first one, the one that all the movies are about. Like there's a lot of whole, there's a whole lot of stuff going on with that. The the first The Born Identity by Robert. Ludlum came out in 1980. Milo, uh, in a past episode, mentioned this, A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. His only work that was pushed after his, you know, his death by his mother. Uh, but quite a good, good read. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Very good. Um, another book, Cosmos, we talked about that in TV. There is a corresponding book by Carl Sagan. Firestarter, which would later become a movie uh, by Stephen King. Also, The Mist, which would later become a movie by Stephen King. And The Clan of the Cave Bear by Jean M. Aul. 
that would become a panned movie later. I thought the movie was all right, starring Dara Hanna. Congo, Michael Crichton, that would become a movie later. <laughs> the Indian of the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks would become a movie later. <laughs> so a lot of movies uh, drew upon 1980 books as inspiration. So there you have it. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Um, do you do you do you have any memories of 1980? I don't, but I have memories of a lot of things that reverberated from 1980. Um, let me know what you think. You can reach me at info at the 80s and 90s dot com. Go to the 80s and 90s dot com and leave a comment on the page. And I'm out of here like Luke Skywalker's hand chopped off by his own father going down into a vent somewhere, rotting and picked up by a poor janitorial droid. <laughs> <laughs>